And our next presenter is Dave Williams. Um, David, where are you? Yeah, come on up. Um, I've always wanted to go. I said that at the beginning of the introduction to this session. And so far, only a couple of private zillionaires have managed to get up to that near space station, right? Yes. And uh, we have had presentations from people who are attempting civilian launches of rockets. This is the Da Vinci Project. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and now we have the real thing. Uh, uh, we've had Julie Payette at this conference. We've had Mark Garneau. Uh, David, if you read your program, book is the very first non-American to hold a senior management position at NASA. And I assume once they put the shuttles back into service, you're going to go up later this yes. year and do three spacewalks. That's right. Three spacewalks. Thanks, Well, I can't tell you how thrilled I am to be here today, and I would like to talk to you about dreams, exploration, and discovery. And my story starts, uh, the story that I'd like to share with you when we get the PowerPoint presentation up here. If we could start the PowerPoint, it would be great, thanks. Um, the story I'd like to share with you is how a little boy who was born in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, grew up to achieve what to me was an impossible dream being able to fly in space, and being able to live and work on board an underwater habitat. And when I was younger, I was like any other kid. I had all sorts of dreams and desires and things that I wanted to do. Uh, I used to love science experiments and things. But when I was in elementary school and high school, I was never what you would call an academic overachiever. And in fact, in the upper right-hand corner, I'm getting my grade one report card, <laughs> much to my chagrin. And I had to take it home to my parents. But I was always interested in exploring, and I spent a lot of time building forts, and I would go out in the woods, and in fact, you would find me most days when I was a kid rafting on a creek that we had by our house when I was much younger. And as I was growing up in the 60s, we began to watch humans exploring space, and I thought, wow, what an absolutely incredible opportunity to be able to fly in space. But as a Canadian, I thought that there was no way I'd be able to fly in space because Canada was the third country in the world to send satellites to space, but we didn't have a human space program. So in fact, what I ended up doing was spending my Sunday nights watching the world of Jacques Cousteau, read the silent ocean and things. And you know, after those uh, incredible television programs, it was bath night, right? Sunday night, bath night. <laughs> so I would go and get my mask and fins, and I'd go into the bathtub, and I'd be exploring the incredible depths of our bathtub and things. But uh, I was very lucky, because in 1967, I learned how to scuba dive when I was uh, 13 years old. And uh, that was really when I dreamed of, in fact, living and working on an underwater habitat. I thought if I couldn't go to space and explore space, what a great opportunity to explore inner space, the undersea world, and do the types of things that I was watching my heroes do every Sunday evening. Well, lo and behold, like so many things in life, I actually flew in space before I ever had a chance to live and work on an underwater habitat. And that's the story I'd like to share with you today on how this all became possible. And it really started for me in 1992 when the Canadian Space Agency ran an ad in the newspaper. Want to be an astronaut? Send in your CV. So I sent my CV in, and uh, there were 5,000 people in Canada who sent their CV in. I believe there were 600 children less than 10 years of age that had theirs in there as well. And uh, there were six rock bands that applied and things like that. But I got my application in, and I was able to join the Canadian Space Agency as an astronaut in 1992 and then was selected to go down to NASA in 1995 and train as a mission specialist or a career astronaut who's uh, trained to work on board the space shuttle and, of course, now the International Space Station. I flew in space the first time on STS-90 in 1998. It was a 16-day space flight. Uh, flew a total of 6.4 million miles, orbited the Earth 256 times, and uh, after that went off to join management and became the director of life sciences at Johnson Space Center for NASA. And fortunately, I was able to escape from management back into the flight world, and now I'm reassigned to STS-118. But uh, during that period when I was in management, I had an opportunity to become an aquanaut living and working underwater, and that was a pretty exciting process. This is the crew that I flew in space with in 1998. It was a very complex research flight, and I'll show you some pictures from it. And it was the last flight of something called the Space Lab, which was an orbiting laboratory that we put in the payload bay of the space shuttle itself. 
Now, training to fly in space is a very lengthy process. We train in a wide range of environments. We have the space shuttle simulator in the left-hand side. The aircraft in the upper right-hand side is something called the shuttle training aircraft that we use to simulate orbiter landings. We fly these high-performance T-38 jets. And all of that is to get ready to be able to fly at 25 times the speed of sound. We also do a lot of uh, training in these launch and entry suits, getting ready to be able to go fly in space. But the really exciting part is the launch. And we fly down to Kennedy Space Center about a week prior to our space flight. We go into something called quarantine to reduce the probability of getting sick when you're in space. And uh, we go out and see the vehicle the night before launch. And uh, it's an amazing experience looking up at the vehicle, thinking that this is going to take you out into space the next day. But there's really nothing quite like preparing you for sitting on top of 7 million pounds of thrust that takes you from being stationary to traveling 25 times the speed of sound in eight minutes. And I'd like to share that experience with you. Here's the uh, orbiter on the launch pad. And hopefully, we've got sound for this. If you can crank the sound up, there we go. Really crank that puppy up. <laughs> Now we're clearing the tower at this point, but the next view that you're going to see is a view that I had from the flight deck of the space shuttle out the overhead window. And uh, we're shaking back and forth under the power of the three main engines. There's the view that I had, absolutely incredible to be able to look at. Seven million pounds of thrust with the two solid rocket boosters, three main engines, continuing to accelerate, breaking through the sound barrier, watching Kennedy Space Center get smaller behind you. It's a really amazing sensation. We do what's called a roll program, so the shuttle's rolling heads down. And uh, about two minutes into flight, we get separation of the solid rocket boosters. They begin to tail off. They come off on each side. And there's some really great footage taken from STS-95, the SRB cam that shows the solid rocket boosters that will re-enter through the Earth's atmosphere, come down, land in the ocean, and we go out and pick them up. And so the launch is absolutely amazing. Eight minutes later, you're out in space, and you get a chance to look down at Florida. It takes 90 minutes to orbit the Earth. So eight minutes later, we're out in space. 90 minutes later, we're back over Florida looking down at Kennedy Space Center. And there's no question we had the fastest ride out of the parking lot that day. <laughs> but uh, when you get out into space, the, uh, the view, of course, is really quite amazing. And uh, this is a shot of a sunrise in space. It takes place over the course of about two minutes. You see a sunrise and a sunset every 45 minutes. And we've just opened the payload bay doors, and this is the kind of spectacular view that you get a chance to see. Well, Neurolab was a research flight, and we did a lot of research trying to understand how the nervous system adapted to being in space. And I could spend literally a whole hour telling you about the research that we did in space. But one of the amazing things that we demonstrated was a phenomenon called neuronal plasticity. And as you know, the brain is made up of billions of nerve cells that are all interconnected. And those connections allow us to perform the tremendous things that we're able to do as humans. And what we really are beginning to understand is that the nervous system can adapt to different environments. And when you challenge the nervous system by being in the microgravity environment of space, the nervous system rewires itself. Those connections between those nerve cells that we thought were static for many years start to change, and the nervous system essentially rewires itself in response to this stimuli. This would be analogous to the motherboard of a computer rewiring itself in certain conditions. And if we can understand neuronal plasticity, perhaps we can help patients recover better from strokes and spinal cord injuries. So it's an amazing research platform, but it's also a fun place to live and work. We would never do this in the Neurolab mission, so I picked on somebody else. But hypothetically speaking, if you wanted to drink your orange juice, you can release a blob of orange juice and have it floating in front of you, sneak up to it, stick a straw in it, and slurp the whole thing down. <laughs> but what's even more exciting is if you want to wash your face in space, you can release a big blob of water, have it floating around in front of you, stick your face in the middle of the blob of water, and go blah, 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 back and forth. It's really quite <laughs> incredible. So, while we're doing these crazy astronaut tricks on the first night that we were in space, one of my uh, good buddies, being a research flight, we're always interested in research, he says to me, you know, Dave, what would happen if you took a blob of water floating in front of you and you put a goldfish in there? 
and the goldfish swam up to the air-water interface, there's no aquarium there, would it know that it's bad to go out in the air? <laughs> or would it just like swim out and flop around out there and we'd have to rescue it and bring it back? And I'd say, no, I'm just trying to go to bed here, you know? It's like, anyway. Eating in space, this is a type of food that you get to eat in space. Uh, it's quite unique, and uh, I could share uh, more discussion with you about the food at break time. But uh, over on the right-hand side is shrimp cocktail, the number one meal choice of astronauts. And you can eat in any orientation you want. You can be right side up, upside down. It really doesn't make any difference at all. I was very fortunate uh, when I flew on STS-90 to be chosen as one of the spacewalkers. In fact, um, I was the first Canadian chosen to be a spacewalk, except the one I was chosen for was contingency, meaning we would only go outside if something broke. So in our case, nothing broke, so I didn't get to do a spacewalk, but I was all trained and ready to go. And now, on my second flight, I'll be able to go out and do three spacewalks. But the beauty of space is really incredible. And you've heard from Jean-Michel, you've heard from Phil. And I really want you to experience what it's like being in space. And there's a great picture of Mount Everest looking down at it from the Space Shuttle Columbia. There's Mount Etna, a volcano, which of course is uh, active at this point. Here's a great shot of Hawaii. Isn't that spectacular? When you fly over and you look out the window, and this is the kind of thing that you see. Here's an interesting shot which uh, for those of you up close in the front may see a couple of pyramids. And those are the pyramids that you can actually see from space. So there's no question that you can see the effect we humans are having on the planet. There's a picture of Key West that you can see from space. And all the things that Jean-Michel told you about the pollution of the oceans, the declining uh, reefs on our planet and things, you can see those without any difficulty. Circulation, circular irrigation wells in Saudi Arabia. Very striking, and if you were coming to visit Earth from another planet, you would realize that Earth is inhabited because the circular structures of nature just don't tend to exist. This is a great picture of contrails left by airliners over Switzerland and uh, in Europe. And um, it's kind of interesting because when I flew on STS-90, my wife is a pilot for Air Canada, and she was flying a 767 between Toronto and Montreal. And for the first time in history, I was able to send a data link from the Space Shuttle Columbia to an Air Canada Airbus A320. So she was on the 320 at the time. And it was funny, it came out of the data link, and it says, from the Space Shuttle Columbia, they didn't believe it at first. And then she realized, no, it's actually, it's real. It's from Dave. <laughs> anyway. This is where we are right now, downtown Toronto. Absolutely incredible. You look out the window, and this is the kind of thing that you can see. And of course, at night, it's really quite spectacular looking out and seeing the city. And here's a more tragic image. You look at this, and now you're becoming experts of looking at the Earth from space. This looks like woods, forested area with cloud in the lower right-hand corner. That's actually forest fires burning in the Amazon with the clear-cutting the tropical rainforest. Well, after 16 days, we get to come back and land on Earth. We leave a big contrail in the sky as the orbiter uh, re-enters the atmosphere. Mission drew to a close. And fortunately, uh, I was then selected to go on the first NASA mission to the Aquarius underwater habitat and lived and worked underwater for seven days. We use this habitat as an analog environment for training astronauts to be on board the International Space Station. And the type of research that we can do in an environment like this is very helpful for us to validate either new technologies that we need in space or help us understand the complex problems of humans living and working in a closed, confined environment. Picture in the upper right-hand corner shows the inside of the Aquarius underwater habitat. In many cases, it's very similar to the uh, service module of the International Space Station. And uh, in fact, we have NEMO-5 is the fifth uh, NASA mission to Aquarius or underwater right now with Peggy Whitson, who is uh, one of the International Space Station crew members on Expedition 4, leading that expedition. So it's just an amazing uh, opportunity to live and work in that environment. Let's see if uh, we can go to the next slide. The clicker is not, there we go. Um, fortunately, I'm going to be able to fly in space on STS-118, and that's going to be an International Space Station flight. It'll probably launch sometime in the 05 time framework, but we're very actively training right now for STS-118, and I did have a chance with our crew to summit Wind River Peak in Wyoming as part of our leadership training with the National Outdoor Leadership School. The STS-107 crew had also summited the same peak, and we took one of their pins with us when we uh, were out on that expedition. Let me just see if we, there we go. 
Well, the International Space Station is under construction, and I thought I'd share with you a little bit of a video of what it's really like being on board the International Space Station. Now, of course, Canada has got two robotic arms in space, one on the shuttle, one on the International Space Station. We are also the first of the international partners to have significant rewards from our investment in space exploration on the International Space Station. MDR has taken the technology for the Canada arm for the space station and adapted it to the new field of surgical robotics, helping surgeons perform complex surgical procedures using robotic assist devices. But you know, this year we had a very, very tragic loss of the Space Shuttle Columbia on February 1st, and I lost seven very close friends. No one said it better but why we fly in space and the joy of flying in space, and Rick Husband, who said it's very humbling and exciting at the same time to be able to actually go and do the kind of thing that he'd always wanted to do, the thing he'd look forward to doing for such a long time. The 107 crew will be dearly missed, but I know the 107 crew would want us to continue to explore on the behalf of all of humanity.
when ideas become reality, it can change people. Wow. I never use the word impossible anymore in the context of dreams because I've been just very, very lucky and proud to be a Canadian achieving my dreams of exploration. But now we're looking at the next generation, and the dream that I have at this point is to look at the 50th anniversary of Apollo, which will come up in the year 2019, to think of reaching beyond where we are today in low Earth orbit to explore the solar system, to look at those first human missions to Mars. Somewhere in Canada is the next generation of Canadian astronauts who will participate in missions like that. We have innovators, engineers, technologists in Canada who will develop the technology to enable us to take that next step in exploration of space, sending humans to the surface of Mars. So my dream now is by the 50th, by the 50th anniversary of Apollo, look to see humans continuing the exploration of space on the behalf of all humanity, in many ways representing the next phase of human evolution. Thanks very, very much for having me. Down to the middle section. <laughs> you guys were slipping into show business too. I think this is the way.